Good morning and welcome to Southside Bible Church. Well, we're currently studying through Peter's first epistle, if you'll turn there this morning, chapter 2. Uh, the Lord's been just really meeting us in beautiful ways. I just love His Word and what is coming out of chapter 2. So this section that we've been looking at over the last month, we've been looking at verses 4 through 12, again, of chapter 2. And we're going to finish that up this morning, and a little bit next week, we're going to begin looking at verse 12, that it's kind of a lap, it kind of finishes it and introduces the new section. So just kind of a brief review. Uh, we're looking at a new temple. Jesus, uh, Peter's teaching about there's a New Testament temple that is no longer built with brick and mortar. It's not a physical temple, but it's a spiritual temple. The most beautiful thing about this temple is the cornerstone. It's beautiful. It's the Lord Jesus Christ, and all the temple is built on him and finds its existence, its purpose, its power, everything, its mission comes from the cornerstone. And the raw materials that he's building this temple with are living stones, which is every believer. And we were dead stones. We had stony, dead hearts. And when you come to the living stone, the cornerstone, you get life. That's what you just heard of, people who have found life in Jesus Christ. When you come and believe and fall upon the cornerstone for salvation, you will be saved. And in this temple, Peter says there's no Levitical priesthood. Now we are all priests in this kingdom. And we come into his presence and we offer up spiritual sacrifices now, which is our, our very life. And we come and we give our lives through Christ as worship now to the Father. In the old temple, the glory of God dwelt in the Holy of Holies. Well, now his glory dwells and is manifested from living stones who are one in Christ, making him their all in all, giving our lives for the spread of his name, loving like no other, will show forth his glory. So the glory of God is on display this morning. The place where the world can see the glory of God then is not in a temple, but in this temple, in his church this is beautiful. And that's where we left off. And this morning, we're going to start looking at the last point of our study in the temple, uh, is that it's a priesthood, but it's to be a holy priesthood. We're, we're, to, we're to be a holy people. Without holiness, this marvelous light, uh, it doesn't shine. It, it will not shine without holiness. Peter is going to make that very clear this morning and maybe make some of us uncomfortable but I'm praying it doesn't just make us uncomfortable, but it would stir you on this morning to love and good deeds because as a living stone, you are to be holy to help in putting the glory of God on display. And so that is our calling this morning is for us to be holy stones in the temple of God, holy priests in this temple that God is building. So let's go before God and we will pray and we will open up his word this morning. Father, we come before you and we thank you for the temple that you're building God, I thank you for the cornerstone, for he is altogether lovely. And I thank you that in him we have found life. We are now living stones. We are uh, little reflections of the cornerstone. God, we are to show uh, a love for you and a love for others, the, the true agape love that has come to us from this living stone. We are to put you on display as we walk and manifest Jesus Christ to this world. Let every heart and every soul uh, grab their calling this morning and take this serious. It matters how we live because the glory of God is at stake. Lord, I pray that that would flow into every heart and that we would be consecrated to you and to you alone, I pray. Amen. Look with me in verse 11 is where we left off. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. So there's something that we need to understand. To respond rightly to this salvation, to shine the marvelous light of Christ to the world, it's very simple. Our Christian testimony is that. <clears throat> it is the key to the glory of God shining forth from us, living stones. It doesn't just happen because a bunch of stones assemble together and call it church. That doesn't do it. It's not magical. Stones walk in, glory goes out. That isn't how it works. It's our testimony. Our testimony is the single greatest tool for evangelism. 
And verse 15 of chapter two, Peter will say it's by doing what is right. And as you go out and do what is right and live what is right and abstain from fleshly lusts that we'll look at this morning, you're gonna put God on display. So verse 12 tells us that the way the Gentiles are gonna glorify God in the day of their visitation, which next week we'll see is the day when they get saved. By what you do, not by what you say. I'm gonna say that again because some of you need to hear this. It is not by what you say, but by what you do. And I'm not saying the truth doesn't matter. I'm saying you can tell people everything about what a great Christian you are, but what this world is wanting to see is what you do. What has this salvation done in your life? That's what they're looking for, the glory of God from people who are shining forth the cornerstone that they have built their life upon, the power of the church. How then do we live? Peter's writing to a church that's being persecuted greatly. They've been scattered abroad throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, which is just modern-day Turkey. They've been driven from their homes, and these Christians have been driven from their homelands. And so the pressure of society and, and the squeezing of their culture has taken a great toll on this church, and Peter is writing a letter now to encourage them in the midst of this. For them to not be squeezed into the mold of the world. Because when the pressure comes, it's easy to get it off, conform to the world, and you'll quit getting squeezed. And that's a temptation for every believer. You live this light and they'll start squeezing. And all you have to do is conform to their way of thinking in life and the pressure will come off. So Peter is writing for them uh, that the pressure is coming because they love the cornerstone. And today we have our critics We have mounting persecution. The church has become a mockery in this society. It is no longer in to be a conservative Christian. And because the world hates us, because it first hated Christ, they're going to say all kinds of evil and slander about us, Peter says. But friends and family and co-workers are going to even hate you. And they're going to be looking for anything to grab and exalt and show that you're a fraud. They want something so you don't salt them. Just give me a reason to say, see, there's nothing to this Christianity. They're just waiting and looking, ready to grab it. So what do we do? Do you think there weren't any hypocrites in Peter's day? Were there no enemies of the cross in his day? How do we combat this reality that we face this morning and that they were facing in Peter's day? And Peter says simply, doing what is right. Doing what is right will silence them. Our silent innocence will silence them. He tells us in verse 12, some are going to go from slandering you to glorifying God in the day of their visitation for your excellent behavior. So they're going to slander you, but those very ones slandering you one day may be thanking you because of your, your behavior was so excellent, they just couldn't deny Jesus Christ. That's what we'll look at next week. But the one enemy of the cross of Christ, this man I was reading, he said, show me your redeemed life and I might be inclined to believe in your redeemer. And Peter's calling us then, let's show our redeemed life. We may be on the very reason the church has lost its power in these days. Why in some areas it's really become impotent. So few churches are growing, but they're beginning to shrink in our land. It's why the world is so unconcerned with our message. Could it be then that we've lost our saltiness? We're no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot, as Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. We've spent the last 30 years with a philosophy in the church of how to make the church more like the world so that they will come in and join us. And discipleship died in the church. And so did the shining of this marvelous light called the glory of God. And then we filled the churches with people who weren't redeemed and they defamed the name of God and the power has just been squelched. The flame is flickering. And guys, it's not what we say that is ever going to get their attention back. People spouting off the gospel with lives that are so off from the message they're proclaiming that they dismiss it before it even comes off your lips. When was the last time, honestly, that someone asked you, what is the hope within you? When was the last time that your Christ-like life got to them and they said, what is the hope within you? 
This is very simple this morning. What Peter is saying, what we do will make them want to hear what we have to say, or what we do will make them not want to hear what we have to say. The problem in our society is that so few have seen a true follower of Jesus Christ. Our lives are to convince the world of the validity of this gospel. And we're to live a kind of life that makes our message believable. And Peter will put out the perfect example at the end of this chapter. He'll say it's the Lord Jesus Christ. That is just some true coming attractions. So we're going to look at the glory of Christ in a couple of weeks. But what I want to spend the rest of our time on this morning is why are we not living the lives that silence our critics? It's as if we're feeding our critics. Why are, why are we not making them glorify God by our excellent behavior on the day of their visitation? I mean, don't you all want to do that? I haven't met many Christians, if any, who do not have this desire rising up within your heart. I hope every believer, you, would, you have to have this desire saying, that's what I want to be. That's what I want to do. I want to be that kind of a light. So then why don't we have more marvelous light shining? And there are many answers. I've thought through many this week, a lot of issues we've already studied even in Peter. But Peter's going to give us a glaring one, and I might even call it the main issue this morning. So look with me again in verse 11. <clears throat> Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. It is our fleshly lusts. Pogo said we have met the enemy and it's us. We have a remaining sin that is still in believers. I've said it so many times. Not reigning, but remaining. Not president, but resident. We still have sin within, but it is not ruling. It's not our master any longer, but it is fighting and it is present in every believer's life. And I don't know why this has taken a back seat in the church today because we have desires within us that are fighting us and that does not mean you're unsaved. That means you're saved. So you've been born again. You've got a new life that now fights against your flesh. And so you have battles within you this morning, so don't walk in faking it, acting like you don't have problems. You do. You're liars if you're acting like you don't. I'm calling you on it right now, okay? We all are fighting. Oh, we're going to look at the word. Greek word is epithumias. We're fighting these battles. So Peter is saying, if we lose this battle with our lusts, we will not be a bright light. And we're going to be a bad testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. That needs to matter to you. That has to grip your heart more than what you did last night. It's got to begin to take root. And if we win this battle, we're going to silence our critics. And some are going to get saved by our excellent life. There's a lot at stake in this battle that we're looking at this morning. And get this as well. The battle is not... Let me work hard to be a good example. I want to work hard so no one sees my sin and my bad habits. I'm just going to smile a lot so that I can be a good testimony. That's a bad testimony. That's not the gospel. And, and that, that isn't what this is calling for. But the battle this morning that Peter's going to have us deal with is on the inside. This is a battle that begins on the very inside of us. Christianity 101, the battle is won or lost in the heart. And the battle of our desires is where the battle fights. You lose this and your actions will follow. And so here's where we need to fight. For cults, the whole thing is clean up the outside. And that's what some of you have learned even in modern day Christianity. All that is taught is how to clean up the outside. And what did Christ say to the Pharisees? You clean the outside of the cup, but on the inside you're full of dead man's bones, rottenness, filth. And so this isn't clean up the outside so you look like a Christian. That is not this at all. This is, this is what the world needs is born again Christians who have been made alive from the inside with a living hope and that seed of the gospel goes in that Peter talked about and in verse 22 of chapter 1, it produces agape love and you become real and genuine. It's from the heart and it flows out into the lives. It's no longer external, it's internal flowing out from this reality of coming to him, the cornerstone. 
fighting our desires for sin that would squelch and dim our testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Guys, this is what the world is crying for. This is what this temple is to be. This is what God designed it, is that this would be a place of men and women striving for holiness on the inside, fighting our desires for flesh so that the world would see a marvelous light of people who are holy within and holy without. That is what God has designed the church to be, and it is time that we repent and come back to being a holy people, shining the light of a cornerstone who's changing and transforming my life. If there's no 2.11, 1 Peter 2.11 going on, 2.12 will never happen. No one will ever glorify God on the day of their visitation. They're going to say, oh, you were a Christian? I didn't know that. The world needs holy living stones who are fighting their sinful lusts and desires. We live in a generation that has quit fighting their sinful lusts and desires. And Peter's going to say, you've got to fight them if we're ever going to be what God has made us to be. This world says, whatever feels good or right, just do it. The modern church in America is saying the same thing, but we tack the name of Jesus on to it. Listen to Christian radio. I won't mention the station, but they'll hear a bunch of songs that'll tell you, it's okay, you're just forgiven. It's okay that you're not growing and that you're not fighting holiness. It doesn't matter. It's only that that God has grace in him. That's it. That isn't the message. We're all failures. Come join the gang. Quit being hard on yourself. We're all just a mess. We're no different than the unbelievers. We're just going to heaven when we're done. This is all a lie. It's nonsense. We're to fight against the remaining sin in our lives. Either you're killing sin or it will be killing you. We are called into this battle against fleshly lusts. That is what a believer is now going to fight against. So let's dig into our text because I'm almost out of time. I hate to say it, that was your introduction. (laughs) Look with me in verse 11. Beloved, I love this word, beloved. You are beloved by God. I wonder what would happen if everyone in this room got that this morning. You, because of Jesus Christ, are loved by God. Beloved, I want you to know that God loves you. And Peter wants you to feel the weight of that before he smacks you with a two by four. This is the velvet glove on the rock that he's about to throw at us. But that's growth for Peter because he didn't use a velvet glove earlier in the Gospel of John. So I want you to hear this. This is a duty to fight these lusts to the one who loves you and gave himself for you. Doesn't that make you want to fight sin? I want to fight because of this cornerstone. That statement does more to my heart than the thought of hell. And so as we begin to look at the fight of lust, you're beloved. You are loved by God. Let that motivate you. Let that do something in your heart. And let it be, I urge you, he says. Which means I beg you. That word means to make a plea. It's urgent. It's passionate. Reciprocate reciprocate God's love as you fight for obedience and fighting these lusts within I beg my own heart and I beg your heart this morning, please, fight these lusts that are battling within our souls to destroy us. And the third thing Peter says is is aliens and strangers. Aliens and strangers. Peter felt led to lay his whole epistle. Do you remember when we began this epistle in verse 1? You're aliens. Uh, you, you You don't belong. You're just passing through. And so as you begin to think through these lusts, they're all telling you that this is it. This is life. You need them here. This is where you're going to find happiness. And aliens say, I, I have a greater place. I'm a citizen. My citizenship's in heaven. I don't have to have all my lusts and desires satisfied here. I, I belong somewhere else. So as we begin to look at lust, let's just start right away. We're aliens. This isn't where we belong. Don't, don't go for the gusto. That's a lie. That old commercial, grab the gusto. <laughs> That's not what we're to do. And he says, here's what we are to do. Abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. What are fleshly lusts? So those are what I've already said. It's remaining sin that every believer has. They're all within us. Until Jesus comes back and redeems us fully, we will have remaining sin that he has said, put to death. Put that to death. 
And so just uh, knowing that has, I, I've had a, a believer two weeks ago say that saved my life just to know that that's there, that there really is a battle. He said, I, I thought I couldn't be a Christian. And it set him free to understand that. So just know that you have lust in the Greek word uh, epi. Thumia, and since we have a lot of visitors, everyone's used to me explaining this word, but it's so important to the Bible, and Peter's, it's fourth time to use it. It's a, it's a big deal. Thumia in the Greek means desires. The word can mean desire, lust, or passions. And, and these lust or passions can be positive or negative. We saw that the angels in heaven have it positively to look into this gospel that they can't get over back in 1 Peter 1, verse 12. They have epithumia saying, what's God doing in redeeming sinners? I can't get over this. I want to just look into it. So we're, we're people who are made with desires. Every one of us have desires. This whole world is built around the fact that we have desires. You marketing majors, man, tee off on that. Just everyone has desires, mark it away and they'll buy anything. Desires are neutral until they're attached to something. And so one preacher said, we are a desire factory. And the question is, are we a factory producing desires for the cornerstone? Or are we a factory producing desires for this world and the lust thereof? The problem is, is when it becomes an epithumia. And that now is a desire that is an over-desire. Epi means over. So now you have a desire that's, that it, it could be a good thing. You want to be married, and now all of a sudden that becomes all you can think about, and it becomes more important than Jesus Christ. So, so thumias can become epi where they own you and control you, and that's, they're, they're, just, they're too big. They become too much. So, But listen to what Peter tells us. Uh, to do with these wrong desires? What do we do with these epithumias that all of us have because we were born of Adam? He says in verse 11, abstain from them. Don't, don't just say, oh, I got epithumias, that's, that's all right. No, abstain from them. Abstain means get away from. But the Bible says don't make provision for them. Mortify them, get rid of them, eradicate them from your life. Why? Because he says they're waging war against the soul. They've come and said war. I'm going against your soul. I want to destroy it. I am, my epithumias want to destroy my soul. They want to damn you and take away the light that we are supposed to be for Jesus Christ. So every one of you have epithumias in your heart that have waged a war against your soul. There's a battle, there's a fight. Don't give me this, I'm a lover, not a fighter. You better be a fighter or you're going down. He's coming after your soul. Abstain from it. How do they war? How, how does this work? Well, they're fighting to destroy you, to bring you to ruin. They really, to bring you to the place where his marvelous light isn't seen. In fact, it's going to be slandered and ridicule. I had a friend who labored for 40 years in the gospel ministry for the name of Jesus Christ. And in a counseling case, he fell into an affair for five to seven years. And the name that he labored to exalt he has become the cause of mud being slung at the name of Jesus Christ. Paul said, I'd rather die than make my boast in Christ an empty one. You quit fighting, you're going to lose. And here's how it works. You have desires, and what they're going to do is they're going to keep you from seeing the marvelous light of Jesus Christ. These desires, if they are cherished and kept or fed they're going to make you blind to the light or at least give you serious cataracts. And so listen to this verse. In 1 Peter 1, we've already studied it. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the epithumias which were yours in your ignorance. So when you were an unbeliever and you didn't understand the gospel, you, you lived in your epithumias because you didn't know there was a God who loved you and gave his son for you. So you just lived in epithumias. That, that was called ignorance. I didn't know, so I, if I don't know, I'm going to live for my lusts and my desires. Ephesians 4, Paul says, in reference to your former manner of life, lay aside the old self, which was being corrupted in accordance with epithumias of deceit. And so he calls them lusts of deceit. And so these desires, I want you to hear this, they're lying to you. They're lying to you this morning. If, if, if you look at porn, if you further this relationship, it says life will be happier. 
If you retaliate to the person who has offended you, I'm going to feel a lot better. If you lie to protect your reputation, it will be well for you. If you steal on your tax return, that extra money will give you security. If you date that unbeliever, you'll be happy and you won't feel lonely anymore. They're lying to you. I promise I've been on the other end in my own life and shepherding, they're a lie. And you're gonna sit there weeping and crying one day saying they lied to me. These epithumias said this is where I would find life. This is where I'd finally be satisfied. They're deceiving you. They're lying to you right now telling you something other than the cornerstone is gonna make you happy. And I'm telling you, throw it out, fight it, abstain from it because anything that says it'll make you happier than the cornerstone is a lie from the pit of hell. Anyone ever buy that? Adam, eat of this tree and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Deceitful desires. They are warring against your soul. Do you believe this? I urge you this morning, abstain from fleshly lusts. <clears throat> How do these passions make war? Well, they put shadows over our thinking so we can't see the light. The parable of the soils says, of them, the cares and desires for other things choked out the seed of the gospel. All the cares and desires for other things, all your epithumias choked out the very gospel. That could be happening to you this morning. All these desires are choking out the glory of this gospel. You can't see the light of what we have seen in Peter. The cornerstone becomes a little pebble in your heart. These desires are growing and being fed and blocking out the marvelous light. You're not even close to being a testimony anymore. The light is so dim, the lust, food, money, security, all that you can see is epithemias have taken over your life and you are not in any way shining this beautiful, bright light. So the message for you this morning is you need to repent and you need to turn back to, to the marvelous light and look at the beauty and the glory of Jesus Christ. These desires make war on the light. And they want to make an eclipse in the middle of the day like we had a few months ago. Everything's just going to go dark. Covetousness. I just want that new car. I need that new patio, the new bike, the new phone, the new pad, whatever it is. And, and all of a sudden, I have to have it. And you wake up going to bed thinking about it. And you wake up thinking about it. And it just keeps growing. And it becomes just another desire in your life. Jesus and this thing are on the same par. This is how it works. We have to abstain from these epithumias. You need to get away from them. Jesus said, cut your right hand off if it causes you to sin. Pluck your right out. Get rid of anything that's going to make you go after and indulge in epithumias. Don't play with them. Don't say, I just want to see how close I can get to my epithumia without going over the edge. Don't do that. Run from them. The battle for a sweet testimony of the power of God begins in the heart fighting these epithumias. Proverbs 4.22 says, watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. All of your life is going to proceed from your heart. Watch over it with all diligence. Guard it. Keep it fixed and keep yourself in the love of Christ. Keep looking at the cornerstone. What did we learn earlier in verse 4? Coming to him is a present tense. Keep coming to him again and again and again so that he'll eclipse epithumias. There's no other way to overcome an epithemia but with a greater desire. Look at Christ and the things of earth will grow strangely dim. And so I'm going to close with one last thought. The remedy for most of our problems, for our desires, for our spiritual cataracts from feeding on these desires then is light. How, how do you let go of the pain, you know, that Zach even testified in his baptism? How about the disappointment? Your life did not work out the way it is and it's become an epithumia and, and you just sit in sorrow and you're becoming bitter. How do you get rid of that? How about frustration? You want to be somebody. Wealth. Uh, in your marriage, you have a justified anger of what your spouse did and you feel right and you're just holding it. And you, How do you let go of that? How do we get out of this? How do we live these lives so that the light will be shining, the beams from the cornerstone into this church, into this world? The war is trying to blind you to this marvelous light by passions for other things. We must put to death the passions that blind us to this light. So what is the light? It's Jesus Christ, the sweetest thing I've ever looked at.
the name above every name. The light is in verse uh, chapter 1 that you were born again to a living hope. The light is that you have an inheritance that's undefiled and perishable and it's never going to fade away. The light is that you're protected by the power of God through a faith that he's going to stick in the furnace to purify and keep growing and strengthening this faith. The light is inexpressible joy and love and faith in Christ. The light is that you were ransomed by His blood, the precious blood of Christ. The light is agape love. The light is thirst for His word. The light is the cornerstone, His marvelous light. The light shines out of the Scriptures. So linger and pray and study and ponder and look at Christ, the cornerstone, who's on every page of your Bible. Fight these epithumias that are waging war on your soul to darken our eyes so that we will lose and not be a testimony at all to this world. And and to our shame is we are not shining the way that we should. We need to get brighter. And so I pray that you would get this this morning and you would fight the fight of faith. That the glory of God would shine forth from this temple and do things in this world for his name's sake That is beyond what we could hope or believe. What would happen with that many living stones shining the light of Jesus Christ? Amen? Abstain. Repent and re-engage in the right battle. And let's just lose ourselves in the cornerstone. Ah, I love Christ. As we close, God's been doing some beautiful things in our young people at the church. And there's just so much light going in and he's moving in power and he's bringing in gifted musicians and singers and songwriters. In two weeks, I've heard of five new songs that the young people in the church have written and they're all beautiful and I want to just keep letting them share them with you. And one of them, uh, I saw the words and as I read the words, it's called Cornerstone. And the whole thing is taken from what we've been learning here in Peter. And And it... This happens to me every time. I've taken five sermons to preach on the cornerstone, and this this guy captured it in a song. Makes me mad. (laughs) I think we should be happy with the gifts God gives us. So I'm I'm taking that back. So what I'm going to do is this group has been working on this, and I just ask them if they would come close the service. And I just want you to take all that we've been studying And I want you to listen now and worship. And the application is, behold the cornerstone. And I just want his light to fill this room. And so I'm going to close in prayer. And then I want you just to worship the cornerstone with me. So if the group would come on up while I'm praying. Father, I come before you. I thank you for the season that we've had looking at this temple. And I thank you for what we've already said. The beauty of this temple is the cornerstone. It's his life in us that looks beautiful. And so we thank you for him, for everything is about him. He's our hope, our trust, our power. Lord, he's, he's coming again. I just thank you for him. And I pray now, Lord, that um, we would worship in our application now, that we would look at the cornerstone and there wouldn't be one soul in this church that has not come to him. Because your word says the ones who stumble over him and reject him, they're going to be destroyed. But the one who will receive and trust and believe in this cornerstone will be saved eternally. God, I pray that you would move in every heart now as we spend this time in worship. Amen.
crown Floods will rise and the wise will still drown There's only one place the storm can tear down Right in the rock, the fortress, the cornerstone The stone rejected, neglected, will stand alone Oh, I believe that when there's war Your house shield, the solid ground In the battlefield, the earth may quake the hills may fall, we will not fear, you'll overcome it all. You are a rock, our refuge, our strength, our cornerstone. Please pray with me. Thank you. Dear God, thank you for this day that you blessed us with. Thank you for bringing us here together, Lord. Pray that you continue to grow us in you and that let us know that you're the only thing that can fill our desires. Nothing, no thing, no person, nothing can fill these desires, Lord, but you. You are the cornerstone and the rock. Bless this day and keep us all safe. In your name, amen.